Sometimes I think it's the least most, you know. Maybe I should write a book like that. You know, I, I started a book. I, I write books, you know, and so I enjoy writing Christian fiction because I have a a Millennium series that's called uh, the first one in the series called Genesis Age, and um, it's well, it's called a thousand years, you know, and it talks about the survivors of those that have gone through the tribulation period and what their life is like from day one in the millennium to and as the books progress genesis age exodus it's a kind of a play on each word genesis and then adding the word age so genesis age exodage uh, levitage in a way of explaining what the millennium will be like and so anyways i like to write books and i write christian fiction and you know it's been a joy you know to share some of the things that you know you can do in fiction that you can't do in reality because sometimes people want to make your fiction reality and although i say that everything that i wrote in my christian fiction series on those books that i fully expect to live because i really do fully expect to live what what i wrote in there but there are some things in there that are challenging for some people because people have a hard time getting along. But anyways, long and short of it is, is that, you know, what has God chosen to do with you? You know, did you know that God chose you? Did you know that God doesn't necessarily use your particular gifts to choose what he wants you to do? He just wants you. He doesn't care what your gift is. He, there's no such thing as this gifting idea, you know, that because, oh, guess what? I'm an eloquent speaker, so God must want me to be a preacher. I don't think so. If you're an eloquent preacher, then you are, if you're an eloquent speaker, then God probably doesn't want you as a teacher because guess what? One of the most eloquent speakers that God used wasn't eloquent. He was a stammerer, and his name was Moses, and he stammered. You could say he stuttered. You could say that he was the most humble of man because he had not quite the gifting that you think he had. Or like Paul. You know, there was Paul and Apollos. Apollos was the one whom everyone looked at because he was like the person whom we could love to listen to and enjoy. And he had this ability, and you know, he was always like up front in the cameras, or if they had cameras in those days. But he was the one that people loved and enjoyed. But Paul, and the guy is just like, it's hard to understand. The guy's obnoxious. You know, he's a pain in the butt. Every time he comes around, you know, he's always got some new thing to tell us, you know, and it's like, ah, get out of here, you know. Who cares if he's the apostle's apostle of his day or the pastor for Christianity of his day? Gee, does that sound like somebody we know? <laughs> Isn't there always somebody obnoxious to you? But let God use them the way he chooses to use them, and you worry about you because God chose you to do something with it. God is using you whether you know it or not. And then today, I did look at the title, so that's why we're talking about it this way. Because God is speaking to me, and I know he's speaking to you. And I know he's sitting here, so let's see what he would tell us. The brave comradeship of God. Then he took unto him the twelve. Luke 18, 31. The bravery of God in trusting us. <laughs> you say... But he has been unwise to choose me, because there is nothing in me. I am not of any value. That is why he chose you, because you're worthless. <laughs> and if you think you're worth something, I don't think so. Let's ruin the self-esteem idea. Let's be real. You're a sinner, <laughs> just like me. Oh Well, as long as you think there is something in you, he cannot choose you because you have the ends of your own to serve. You are serving yourself as long as you think that you are of an ability and capability. But if you have let him bring you to the end of your self-sufficiency, then he can choose you to go with him to Jerusalem. He can choose you to go with him all the way. And that will mean the fulfillment of purposes which he does not discuss with you you may not know the end at the beginning. 
We are apt to say that because a man has a natural ability, therefore he will make a good Christian. It is not a question of our equipment, but of our poverty, not of what he brings with us, but of what God can put into us. Not a question of natural virtues of strength of character, knowledge and experience. All that is of no avail and worthless in this matter. The only thing that is important to God is that we are taken up into the big compelling, the big calling, the big yearning and pulling of God and made his comrades, his followers, his disciples. The camaraderie of God is made up out of men who know their poverty. They recognize who they are for what they are. He can do nothing with the man who thinks he is of use of God. As Christians, we are not out for our own cause at all. We are out for the cause of God, which can never be our cause. We do not know what God is after, but we have to maintain our relationship with Him whatever happens. We must never allow anything to injure our relationship with God. If it does get injured, we must take time and get it put right. The main thing about Christianity is not the work we do, but the relationship we maintain and the atmosphere produced by that relationship. That is all God asks us to look after, and that is the one thing that is being continually assailed. If you recognize that, then you'll realize that it's not about the ministry. It's not about how many notches you can put in your Bible belt, or in your Bible cover, or in your Bible itself. It's not about all the names that you can list and the thousands of people you say that got saved. Because the reality is, is that if you talk to any of the biggies that you know, you know, or don't know, that if they came from the Jesus movement and they have gone out to do these marvelous, wonderful evangelistic outreaches and they have these huge concerts, they know and they'll tell you of all the thousands that come, that come forward to get saved, how many stay with Jesus? How many know Jesus? Part of the Billy Graham Association was the idea that, you know, involve the local churches to be involved with it because there needs to be that, that follow-up, that consistency with recognizing that just because a person comes forward and says, I do, doesn't mean they did, and doesn't mean that they know where to go when they do what they did that they did. Because in the emotion of the feelings of the yearning for God, has God called them onward? And as we know in history, there was several great evangelists that we read the writings and go, oh, wow. But it says that of certain men of God, that though they were eloquent speakers, not many, if few, but few, ever lasted beyond after the revival meeting. So what God can do is if you know that you have no ability, if you know that you're not very Christian, if you know that you're the chiefest of sinners, then God wants you. But if you think you're something special, I'll be the first to tell you, I doubt that the Holy Spirit is in you. Because you see, well, the man that has no need doesn't require the Holy Spirit to fill him. But the man that is in need requires the Holy Spirit to be with him daily. Requires that God be for him, in him, and about him. In my life, because of the time that I was dying, because of the time even now that the consequences of that incurable disease that ravaged my body and caused me to be laying flat out on my back for years in VA hospitals because of Crohn's disease killing me and nearly dying from it regularly and then surgeries from it had God not lived in me and brought me through it and I did not maintain my relationship with him then I fell back into the weakness and the death working in me and <laughs> to this day, I can tell you, if I decide to sin and go my own way, believe me, when I walk out from underneath that protection that God has over me, and I kind of let the storms of life come at me, and the reality of my 
health slowly slip away, then God lets my flesh become more aware of the curse that's upon it. And you can watch me go from today, brawny and scrawny and scrawny, well actually brawny, to go to scrawny in 24 hours. I have gone from, gosh, 140 pounds to 80 pounds in three days. No problem. Now, God has brought me to a healthy place where I've gone up to 180 and I'm beginning to go, oh God, you know, we need to get skinny again. <laughs> so, recognize that if you're disabled in the world, you're enabled in Christ. But if you think you're able in yourself to be used by God, you're likely disabled by God to be used from Him to accomplish His greater work that He would choose only those who have to, want to, desire, and care to have a constant one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus on an ongoing basis and not let anything come in between. Not life, not death, not principalities, not powers, not things above, nor things below, not family, not friends, not church, not anyone else ever come between Jesus and you. And you know what? I like it that way. <laughs> Don't you?